So now I'm going to jump into a little bit more of the, the risk assessments. A lot of you have an understanding of risk assessments, have sat in through some risk assessments. We're going to talk about risk and talk about the different kinds of risk. This is, is really important when we talk about this idea, maybe you've heard incremental risk versus flood risk or dam and levee risk versus flood risk. We'll talk about that. <clears throat> we'll describe the risk management and assessment process and identify some of the main outcomes. First question on the, on the quiz this morning, so write this down if you're worried about the, the answers. What is risk? Right? Everybody's played the, the board game, maybe. Risk. Right? You're, the idea is something bad could happen. Not guaranteed to happen. Something bad could happen. And really, when we do a risk assessment, we're trying to figure out, well, what's that something bad? How bad could it be? And when we talk about could, how likely is it that it's going to happen? That's the whole concept of a risk assessment. So something bad could happen. We also talk about that in, in mathematical terms. When we talk about risk, it's likelihood times consequences. Helps you get this understanding of an expected annual consequence. Um, but it all comes back to that basic understanding of all right, something bad could happen. When we break it down into more of a <coughs> technical terms, we really have these three major components when we're talking about risk. We got the hazards. Um, what are the hazards and how likely are they to occur? Uh, so how would you, from an engineering perspective, how would you uh, portray hazards in a, in a mathematical term it, to feed the risk equation, what's a typical way of, of talking about hazard. Talk about hazards, we're talking about a, a, a stage frequency type curve. Um, <clears throat> performance. So how will a levy, in this case levy or dam, perform in the face of those hazards? So for all these different potential loads, how's the levy or dam going to perform? What do we, how do we talk about those in engineering terms? What kind of a what we call those, the relationship there. For performance, we talk about fragility curves, right? System response probabilities. That's, so if you're, if you're looking at these different aspects of it, right? You need your, your loading, you need how everything's gonna perform with, in response to those loadings. And then the last piece is the consequence. Um, who and what is in harm's way? How susceptible to harm are they? And then ultimately, what, how much harm is, is caused? Okay, so for dam and levy, for understanding of the dam and levy safety programs, right, what do we do? We go out there and we build a levy, and then what happens? Right? You, you, there's, you built that levy for a reason. Probably there's some people there that you wanted to reduce their risk. As soon as you build that levy, now everybody says, well, that's even a more desirable place to live, right? So more people end up moving in there. So whatever you did to assess how big that levy should have been in the first place, um, no longer makes sense, right? Risk is changing over time. People are moving in. So, and the same thing's happening downstream of our dams. So it's an ongoing process where for the dam and levy safety program, we need to understand how those risks are changing, stay on top of that, and make sure we're reinvesting back into that infrastructure or program. So that's really what we're all about is understanding how those risks change um, and, and making wise decisions. Another question. So risk to people and property associated with living near rivers and oceans is increasing. Why? So yeah, degradation of existing defense, uh, increase in population, climate change, improved understanding. So what do we mean there by improved understanding? It's not that necessarily the risk changed, but our understanding of the risk has changed. And a good example of that is what happened in uh, New Orleans during Katrina. A bunch of levees failed and had weaknesses that we didn't know about, right? Overtopping, uh, erosion behind the flood walls leading to failure. So all of a sudden, we could look across our portfolio and say, well, anywhere we had those types of levees, our understanding of the risk behind those flood walls um, changed. So that's what we were talking about there. I was lucky enough to spend a year over in the Netherlands and, and talk about how they do risk assessments for their dam or for their levies. Um, and this is a, <clears throat> a figure that they showed back to this idea of climate change. Um, 
And if you look over the last thousand years, you can see the average sea level rise and that y-axis there is meters. So it's gone up about a meter. Um, but at the same time, by levying everything, those peaty soils, they got a lot of subsidence. So the end is sinking, water's going up. They have major challenges there trying to stay on top of, of keeping their, their feet dry. So with that challenge, we have the core, large portfolio, limited funds. So let's get smart about prioritizing which projects we spend our money on first, and also what do we do to reduce the risk for a given project, right? So it's, it's both of those. It's the portfolio assessment to figure out where the risks are highest, but it's also for a given project, let's talk about the options and all, for reducing risk and figure out which one makes the most sense. <clears throat> okay, risk management process. Any of you that are really into this risk assessment, um, I would recommend this uh, book. It's down there on the left. Failure of Risk Management, Why It's Broken and How to Fix It by Hubbard. It's really an interesting read and points out some really good stuff. And that's where this figures from. But really, it's the, the process is let's identify risk. How can Dan and Levy breach? That's also what we talk about as a potential failure modes analysis, which I'll cover a little bit more later. Um, assess risk. How likely is it? What are the consequences? Will intervention be successful? That was another major understanding for us in the, the CORE's Levy Safety Program. We started doing all these risk assessments and identifying, well, we should be having a lot more levy failures than we're actually having. So either our risk assessment process is broken or something else is going on. And that's when we started to really understand how significant intervention is when it comes to preventing levy failures across the country. We use intervention all the time. Sometimes it's built into the design of the levies. Um, so you have to understand that we're out there intervening, flood fighting, and being very successful at it. And you have to build that into your risk assessment to really understand the true risks. And then what are our best options for, for managing those risks? Again, I said <clears throat> life safety is paramount. Um, every time there's a major flood with a lot of loss of life, there's a bunch of laws that go into effect, new flood control acts. Um, that's how things change in our country when it comes to, to improving safety. Our whole focus is on, on life safety. It's not our only focus, that's where we start the discussion. Um, again, likelihood management is not risk management. We can't just focus on the structure and how to reduce the likelihood of a structure failing. We need to also understand the consequences and be able to talk about how to, to manage consequences in the face of a larger flood event. So um, <clears throat> to do that, with life safety is paramount, and we understand consequence management is part of risk management, you got to be able to talk about potential loss of life, what causes people to lose their life during a flood event, because that's how you start to identify ways to reduce it. Right? You can't just focus on the engineering part of it. You got to focus on the, the people part as well. Um, and this idea of, of proxies don't work, right? A lot of people will say, well, understanding potential loss of life is really hard. I don't believe the estimates they're coming up with. Let's just use population at risk instead. Um, I think the easiest way for me to understand this, right, is if you if you if you put two houses right next to a levee, one's right next to a 30 foot tall levee, and the other's next to a two foot tall levee. If that levee breaches, population is at risk in both of those houses, right? But the potential for loss of life is is way different, right? So. You got to go that extra step. If life safety truly is paramount, you got to understand all the factors that go into potential loss of life. It's not just population at risk. Same for economics. In many cases, these are highly correlated, but, but not always. And that's what matters. Um, and then scalability. We're going to talk a lot about that this week. But <clears throat> you don't need to go in and do a detailed life sim assessment. Anytime somebody says, hey, do you, do you have any idea what the consequences are associated with this levy or dam? I told you we've done 2,500 um, 
risk assessments for levees and over 800 for dams. We have not applied LIFESIM for every one of those, right? We did a scalable approach. We used the understanding of what goes into LIFESIM and we did what we call a screening approach to get a rough estimate of potential loss of life, something you could get to in a day or two. Um, so understand when you can scale your efforts back and, and we'll talk a lot about that this week. These ideas of screening SQRA is what we call a semi-quantitative risk assessment. QRA is a fully quantitative risk assessment. Um, so screening, that's really what we've used for really just understanding our portfolio and prioritizing activities. And by prioritizing activity, that really is which ones do we go into a higher level risk assessment on first, trying to, to pinpoint this highest risk and reduce them as quick as possible. Um, and then the QRA is when we start talking about alternatives to reduce risk. Increasing costs, increasing detail, decreasing uncertainty. That's what it's all about, is, is getting a, a, a results that you have less uncertainty about to, to inform those really important decisions. Okay, another FN chart here. So how do we use risk? I say improved communications, uh, but I'm not a communication expert, I'm an engineer. And I use a chart like this and I say, I think that would be very helpful in, in communicating with people about risk. Um, but not everybody agrees, so that's why there's a question mark there, because sometimes you put a graphic up, a graph, and people just turn off right away. But you can start talking about answering some, some common questions. What's, what's the source of your risk? So is it because it's really likely to breach in any given year? or is it because you have really high consequences, or is it some uh, combination of the two? The, why I like to use these kind of charts is to be able to talk about where risks are relative to other systems. When it comes right down to it, right, everything is relative. If I own a dam or a levy and somebody does a risk assessment and comes back and says, your risks are high, I'm gonna be like, well, that's, that doesn't sound good. But then if they say, but everybody else's are higher, I'll be like, well, okay, I'm great. Um, so this relative understanding of where you fall in with the rest of the portfolio is a, is a good way to communicate um, back to the, the owners and operators of our infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> and then what, what can be done? Once you understand the risk, how do you move it down, down and to the left? What are your alternatives for getting there? We talk about this idea of risk informed instead of risk based. And this goes back to what I was talking about earlier, right? Is we got these models, um, but no matter what, you have built a computer model, put together a bunch of mathematical equations that are trying to simulate a very complex system. And you're gonna, by doing so, you're gonna learn a lot of interesting, useful information, but the models are, are still gonna be wrong, right? So there's a lot to be gained from using them, but you got to be very skeptical of the results. Um, so we don't just take the results from the tool and say, all right, there's your answer. That's what we would call risk-based. It's risk-informed. Let's take that information um, and move out. And if you say, you know what, I don't have enough information to make a decision, no verdict, let's go do some more work. At that point, you're still making a, a decision. Um, so that's back where this idea of scalability comes into play. Like, can we get to a decision in the amount of time we have and then understand there's a lot of uncertainty about it and talk about how to reduce that uncertainty moving forward. Some of you may have seen this idea of our, <coughs> our levy or dam safety action classification, uh, very high to very low, one through five. That's how we manage risks within the core. Uh, FEMA has something similar. Reclamation has something similar. Everybody's like, well, we're gonna call it something slightly different, but we all have the same, same concepts, um, where we start to <coughs> broadly categorize um, the risks for each of our projects. And that helps inform how we move forward on those. Um, but our risk characterization is a, a narrative story, including the risk driver. So every risk assessment we've done, there's at least a paragraph that says, here's our understanding of the risk, what's driving that risk and why. Um, then this levy safety action or dam safety action classification is for prioritization within the core. Um, and then recommendations. And this is another one 
that comes out of risk assessments is that's really important is, all right, you've done all this. Now give me a concise set of recommendations that helps me understand what I should be looking at, prioritize those, and let us know what we need to be doing to go out there and reduce those risks. This is what that looks like for our um, dams and levees. So we've done it for, for levees. That LSAC 1 is the very high risk. Uh, five is low risk or the lowest risk. What you see here is there's not a lot of very high risk systems, and and that's good, right? If we said half the in, the the inventory was very high risk, then that wouldn't really help us prioritize because then we just have a whole bunch of high risk stuff. So <clears throat> we've had a few that have identified as very high risk. Um, then a, another smallish segment of high, moderate. This says in progress, but we just actually finished this last year, um, and low. This was from our screening effort. We didn't call anything very low risk from our screening effort, it's just because there's too much uncertainty to go in there and say, yeah, we're really sure. Um, it's like going to the doctor and him looking at you for five minutes and saying, you're perfect health, everything's fine, right? To really get to that level of understanding, you need to spend a little more effort. We're not comfortable getting there from the screen. Um, <clears throat> we, we do the screening effort using the screening tool, but what's really important from the, for the risk management process is every one of those screenings go through a national QAQC cadre to make sure we're being consistent, to make sure all the teams that have, that have applied these, the screening tool throughout the country um, applied it the same way, using the same interpretation of the guidance. Um, so you have a smallish team that has looked at all those, and then they all go up to the senior oversight group that gives the final recommendation on an LSEC. So we've had one group of people that I sit on for the last, on this group for the last 10 years that have seen every single levy um, in the core, and that's how we get to that consistency. Uh, it's a challenge, it's expensive, but it, it's necessary to get to that level of consistency. Here's another way of looking at that, um, <coughs> combining dams and levees in, in a different graphic. Um, but really it gets to that, that better understanding um, and back to that idea of we're investing $500 million a year back into all these dots up here. Let's make sure we're making the best decisions possible. What else do you get out of risk assessments? In this case, it's screening. Part of our screenings, and we'll talk about this more tomorrow, is understanding the uh, warning and evacuation process, understanding how effective the flood warning might be. So what we collected for every area behind our, all of our levees is what kind of warning plan does the emergency management agency have in place? And you can see that 13% had no warning plan or it was really out of date. But 50%, almost 50%, had a nice detailed uh, warning plan that, that was specific to flooding. And then others had just a, a more general all-hazard all warning plan. And uh, same thing about evacuation planning, how much evacuation planning has been going on. So you see a breakdown of that also in all of our levied areas. That can be really useful information to start re-engaging with sponsors, re-engaging with talking with FEMA about the needs that are out there across the nation for this kind of information and planning. Okay, let's talk about the different flavors of risk. So this one, um, there's the, the, the idea of flood risk. That's risk due to flooding in an area considering all flood sources, right? So overtopping, breach prior to overtopping, uh, runoff from in internal flooding, rainfall, all of that. Um, <clears throat> we also call this residual risk or also something known as, as total risk. Now, dam or levee risk is different. And if you're doing stuff for the core or FERC, um, you're going to have to be able to talk about these separately, right? This is very specific to the potential for poor performance of that dam or levee. This is what we would also call incremental risk. So it's just a, a piece of the total flood risk. Um, and then there's the non-breach risk. So if you had a levy out there 
that was completely unbreachable, right? There's no way of breach, but it can still overtop and lead to consequences, right? So there's still some risk associated with that. That's this idea of non-breach risk. And to get to your total flood risk, um, you talk about the, the dam or levee, so that incremental risk associated with poor performance, and add that to the, to the non-breach risk. Because a lot of what we do is, is focused on incremental risk. Um, so you need to be able to understand, all right, here's the consequences that would have occurred with if nothing breached. You have a major flood event. You got major releases through your spillway, but everything's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Then you add a breach on top of that. Your incremental consequences are the difference between the non-breach and what happened because of that, that breach. And why that matters is, <clears throat> here, here's different ways to, to look at that, right? Um, you can talk about an area where you don't have a levee or any sort of infrastructure yet, right? So you're going to have flood risk out there. And you say, you, we want to reduce this flood risk. If you go in and build a levee, what do you do? Often you're going to reduce the likelihood and probably increase the consequences if something does go wrong, right? Because you're going to end up putting more water on, on people, a lot less frequency, but it'll be more. So you can talk about how it changes when you put in infrastructure, um, and then you can talk about what's causing that risk, whether it's the, the non-breach risk and the, and the levy risk. So you can see here, in this case, your non-breach risk is real close to your total flood risk or your residual flood risk. The levy risk is really small. Um, so these are good ways to think through stuff because maybe you don't want to spend a whole bunch of money to reduce the likelihood of seepage and piping leading to a breach if you're not actually changing the overall risk much at all, right? And that's an important concept to get to get in your in your head. But <clears throat> when you see charts like this, especially in the core, this is very specific to dam or levee risk. It's not the whole flood risk picture. It's the dam or levy risk, because that's our job is to manage the performance issues, the potential for, for poor performance. So that's what each one of those dots represent. So how do you go about making decisions on reinvesting in your infrastructure when you're talking about life safety is paramount, right? If you're talking about economics, it gets pretty straightforward, cost benefit, net benefits, all right, this is what we can afford. This is what's economically justified. But if you're talking about life safety is paramount, what is economically justified in terms of reducing that risk? And that's where these concepts of tolerable risk come in. Um, so this TRG, tol Tolerable Risk Guideline 1, that we have is this idea that the society is willing to live with the risk to secure the benefits of living where they are. So we have two of those. We have um, <clears throat> what we call the, the societal risk guideline, and that's what the, the blue one is. Sorry, I don't know if I have the pointer here. Um, so the blue diagonal line there is our societal risk guideline. The, the basic concept here is society is less willing to, to accept those really large disasters. Um, so as the potential consequences get higher, we're willing to accept a, a lower likelihood of those occurring. And the red, li red line there is the individual risk guideline. And what that is, it's 10 to the minus 4. And how that was developed was, all right, and it, it goes back to the, the nuclear um, industry. Right, you're going to go in and, and build a project somewhere that could increase the risk for certain people that live next to it um, while providing benefits to a whole bunch of people elsewhere. Um, so this, this individual risk concept is we need to make sure we're not increasing anybody's background risk, their potential, their likelihood of dying in any given year um, in any appreciable way. So what they did is figured out, all right, I, mean, I think it goes back to like a 12-year-old a girl, the likelihood of a 12-year-old girl dying in any given year um, was around 
10 to the minus 3. And so they said, well, let's go an order of magnitude less than that, and we'll make sure we're not increasing anybody's risk by building this infrastructure uh, in an appreciable way. And that's this individual risk guideline. So if you have a project that plots up and to the right of those, that's what we would generally say, you know what, you're not meeting tolerable risk guideline number one. You should be doing whatever you can to move below that. It's a little more complicated than that. All right, there's some other things that go into that decision making, but the basic concept is if you're up and to the right of those lines, then you're justified in investing to bring the dam or levy risk down below those. Um, then we have other total risk guidelines, right? It's not just about the risk. It's continued recognition. You're out there. Um, <clears throat> um, and really that building risk awareness, how I like to talk about this is you're out there talking to the emergency managers. Um, all right, you can go out there and talk to the public all day about, hey, you live behind a levee. You need to be concerned about it. Here's what your risks are. They're usually not listening. Um, <clears throat> The only time they're listening is when there is a, an event and they get a warning say, hey, you should evacuate. That's when they're going to start listening. So you need to be talking to the people that are telling them to evacuate, making sure they understand the risk. So when the time comes, they're telling the population the right things. Day-to-day -day responsibilities. So you're, you can't just say, all right, that life is good. We're out of here. You got to do the daily operation and maintenance, monitoring. Um, and then the last one is to actions to reduce risk. Maybe you're down there below the societal and tolerable risk or the individual risk guidelines. But maybe you can spend $5 to reduce the risk a lot more, right? So as low as reasonably practicable, if there's cost-effective things you can do to further reduce the risk, you should be doing it. Risk assessment process, no matter what you're doing, whether it's a screening or a higher level risk assessment, you're going to go through these same steps, right? Scoping, data gathering, potential failure modes analysis, for screening, we did that ahead of time and we looked at the same potential failure modes for every single levy, but it's still a potential failure modes analysis. Then you go through the expert elicitation. You've identified the failure modes. Expert elicitation is where you go in and try to understand and quantify the likelihood of those failure modes occurring. Then your conclusions and recommendations, risk characterization, and communication. Communication um, can't be stressed enough and the core specifically is investing a whole bunch of money in communication teams so that we can start talking about all this good work we're doing in ways people can understand. A little more on potential failure modes analysis. Um, it's really a brainstorm session. I know some of you have sat through these, right? <clears throat> you rely a lot on a facilitator uh, to be able to talk to all these people um, that should know about the data level. So you don't just show up and say, let's go. You have to do a lot of background research, understand the construction of the dam or levy, look at all the photos that are available, the design, past performance. That's all the stuff you need to know before you jump into potential failure modes analysis. Um, you lay out all the potential failure modes, even some that might sound really, really extreme, crazy, no chance they could happen. You lay them all out and then you start screening those out to the ones that are really driving the risk. But for each one, you talk about what makes them more or less likely? What additional work needs to be done to improve our understanding um, and reduce our uncertainty? Is it necessary? Um, and then really for what we're talking about <clears throat> here is for each of those failure modes that you think is a risk driver, you can't just stop with likelihood of it happening. You need to talk about what's that going to look like in terms of consequences. So what are the, what's the breach going to look like? Where is it? How long is it going to take? How, are, are people going to be able to see this happening ahead of time and start this, the warning process? And then there's a failure mode description in text, but we also can talk about it in terms of an event tree. So if any of you have heard of an event tree analysis, this is what it would look like. Where this one's a pretty detailed one for concentrated leak erosion. Um, you start with the flaw. Do you have a flaw? the initiation, continuation, progression, um, potential for intervention, and then breach is all laid out here. And what you do at, in this expert elicitation after you've laid out this event tree, 
is you get the right experts to go through and talk about the likelihood of each one of these happening. So each one of these nodes. So what's the likelihood that you have a transverse crack in the embankment due to differential settlement? And you'll have your team of six or seven experts that really understand that component of this. And you'll just have a <clears throat> kind of a, it's not really a voting process, but you're, you're asking them, you're eliciting their information from them. You gather all that, you have a range there, you talk about it, make sure everybody was on the same page in terms of what the issues were. Uh, you may re-elicit it once everybody has a, is on the same page. And then you'll have an understanding there, but usually it's a range because you're getting multiple people involved. And that's where you start getting some uncertainty about your, your results. You do that for each one. And how it plays out is <clears throat> for each load interval. So let's just talk about like this bottom one here, the stage greater than 1550. Really high stage, really unlikely to happen in any given year. That's what that 0 0.001, one in a thousand chance of occurring. Um, <clears throat> but if it does occur, You've, you've set up an entire event tree for st slope stability. Like I showed earlier, you multiply all those nodes together. That's the likelihood of seeing a failure due to slope stability under that load level. And then for each one of those failure modes, you have to put a, a consequence assessment with it. So you lay out these what can be really complicated event trees, but that's how we get to our, our risk estimates. Because then really you just multiply everything through, um, and, and that's an expected annual life loss in this case. That's how you get to that expected annual life loss, using an event tree approach. Okay, a little bit more, <clears throat> and I think if any of you have been involved in this and you haven't seen this type of a setup next time you're involved in one, now you know. It's up to you to make sure you're starting to show the information in this manner. So start with a whatever situation or scenario you're looking at. In this case, it's a, a sunny day failure. And put the hydrograph up there. So this is your breach hydrograph. And then start labeling it, right? <clears throat> so at some point, your failure mode initiated. And that could be water flowing through a crack. Um, and that could have been years in advance, right? Some of these failure modes take forever to, to progress and actually lead to a breach. But the, what you see here is the, <clears throat> the, the, the physical beginning of it, but then it got to a certain point where the seepage increased enough that you were at least able to observe a difference in what the, the, was flowing through that, that crack. Um, so there's a long time between that, in this case, between there and the collapse of the embankment. So what's going on between when you've observed that there may be an issue to the collapse of the embankment. All right, that's where you're starting to do intervention, right? Like, hey, we've identified there's a problem. Let's get out there and try to, to intervene and keep it from occurring. Um, but at some point, you're welcome for the fancy graphics, by the way. Um, at some point, um, you've got to the understanding that you're probably not going to be able to stop this breach from occurring. You gather enough evidence that you think it's okay to issue an evacuation. That's a hard thing to come to, especially if you're sitting around in a room with experts. You can't just be a bunch of engineers understanding that, right? It's the, it's the person who makes that decision needs to be involved to really get to when, how much evidence they would need to issue that evacuation. So regardless, if you lay it out like this, <clears throat> then you can start to connect that, the, the, the breach model with your warning and evacuation timeline. And this is really the only way to get there in a way that everybody's on the same page. Because then you can start saying, well, how long does this go from when you see that seepage or the, the potential for seeing it to when you get to that full breach, right? So people that understand the Daniel Levy need to understand how it's built, understand the failure mode, and how long it would take to get to that breach. Um, and then you start talking about how much evidence you would have and when you would issue that, that warning or the, the evacuation, right? There's going to be a lot of uncertainty there, 
if you jump into a tool like LifeSim or FIA, you can you can put a lot of uncertainty bounds on that, so that's okay. But still, this is how you line up that hydrograph, your breach model, with your evacuation timeline. Put up a graphic like this, make sure everybody's in the room talking about it. That's, that's really the only way I've seen to be successful. So that's it. <clears throat> Summary, risk management involves consequence management. Those are the components of risk. Um, and scalability, we'll talk more about that in the next one. But scaling your, your efforts to the decision is, is an important part.